Good um, morning, um, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, depending on where you're ca uh, calling in from. Welcome to this uh, launch event for the IA's report on uh, direct air capture. My name is Timo Gül. I'm uh, the head of the Energy Technology Policy Division here um, at the IEA. I'm joined here by my colleague uh, Sarah Boudinis from our uh, CSUS unit, who is the lead author um, of this uh, report and who will um, in a short moment present the highlights um, of um, this uh, report before we move on to um, moderated panel discussion. Um, for this panel discussion, we'll have the honor to have uh, two internationally recognized uh, experts with us today. Um, that's uh, Dr. Julio Friedman, who is chief scientist at Carbon Direct and non-resident fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. And it is Dr. Emily Grubert, who is deputy assistant secretary of um, the Office of Carbon Management at the US Department of uh, Energy. She is also an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering and by courtesy of public policy at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And we're particularly happy um, to have both of them here, of course, but um, in case of Emily, uh, who is uh, very busy during these days, um, I, I would like to uh, say big thanks uh, already in advance for taking the time. Now at the IEA, um, we are firmly committed to working with countries to shape clean energy transitions. Um, uh, working with countries around the world to achieve net zero emission goals. Just last week, we hosted our IEA ministerial meetings uh, where we uh, welcomed energy and climate ministers from more than 40 countries around the world, as well as more than 30 CEOs and industry leaders. The meeting, this ministerial meeting, uh, marked the launch of a new era for the International Energy Agency with a strengthened mandate to supporting countries in uh, the global effort to attain net zero emissions by uh, mid uh, century in the energy sector. Uh, we are particularly happy, of course, to be able to do so under the continued leadership of our executive director, Dr. Fatih Birol. The new IEA mandate emphasizes the importance of ensuring energy security during the energy transition and the important role um, of the IEA in leading the global energy sector's fight against climate change. Inherent in this mandate is the IEA's comprehensive uh, analysis of clean energy technologies. When we produce scenarios and if when we derive uh, recommendations, we rely on um, the analysis of more than 800 different technologies and we consistently highlight the need for a broad portfolio of clean energy technologies and solutions to achieve climate goals. Some of these technologies are very well understood. Um, they are commercially available today. The costs keep falling. Key examples are, of course, solar PV, uh, wind, uh, as well as uh, electric cars. The rapid scale up of these technologies holds the key to bringing down emissions to 2030 in a way that aligns with the global 1.5 degrees temperature goal. It is equally important to scale up these technologies for reducing fossil fuel import dependency in the world where Russia's invasion to Ukraine is a stark reminder of the need to keep energy security in focus. But a net zero world cannot be reached by renewables and electric cars alone. It requires a major acceleration in the development and deployment of technologies that are only just starting to uh, get commercially uh, available today, getting a foothold in energy markets. Direct air capture is one of those. The IEA was in fact among the first uh, organizations to incorporate direct air capture into its scenario analysis back in uh, the year 2020. And since this time, we have seen a groundswell of interest and activity in DAC technologies. This is excellent news in my view, uh, given the potential DAC can have to contribute to net zero emission goals. Capturing CO2 from the air can serve two major purposes for reaching net zero emissions. First, to remove carbon from the atmosphere and second, to provide a source of climate neutral CO2 
for products that require carbon, such as synthetic fuels for aviation. Sarah will cover this in her speech in some more detail, but let me briefly explain why carbon removal is actually important. Um, the term net zero here um, has two sides of, to this equation. On the one hand, we need to bring down emissions through accelerated deployment of all clean energy um, technologies as much as possible. There is literally no alternative um, for that. And given the rapid cost decline of key technologies, such as the ones that I already mentioned, renewables, batteries, and in fact, increasingly um, hydrogen, there is also no excuse for not doing so. On the other hand, we must bring carbon removal technologies into the market as quickly as possible as well in order to be able to balance emissions that are difficult to abate. In our net zero by 2050 scenario that we released in May uh, last year, there are still around two gigatons of emissions from the global energy system uh, in 2050, mainly in heavy industries and long distance transport. These emissions in our scenario analysis are balanced to net zero through direct air capture with CO2 storage and through bioenergy with CCS. At two gigatons, the level of such technology-based carbon removal in our pathway is substantially lower than in any other scenario considered by the uh, IPCC. However, it is vital to be able to achieve net zero as early as possible. Since we released our net zero by 2050 roadmap um, uh, last year, there have been many positive signs of progress um, with a growing number of countries committing to net zero in the lead up to the conference of the parties of the UNFCCC um, to COP26. But energy transitions are also facing significant headwinds in the near term. CO2 emissions climbed again, according to our recent IA analysis in 2021, reaching a new historic high. And Russia's invasion to Ukraine has fundamentally changed global energy dynamics, creating challenges for energy security in particular in the near term. Successful commercialization of DAC could substantially improve our pro prospects for reaching net zero by 2050. But DAC obviously is also not a silver bullet and it doesn't come without challenges. Today, costs are high, technologies are energy intensive, and the markets are still immature at a very early stage of uh, deployment. This is why I think our report is um, particularly timely, it examines the opportunities that direct air capture has and the challenges that come with its deployment. And it's now a great pleasure um, to hand over the floor to uh, Sarah Boudinis to talk us through the highlights of the report. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simo, for the introduction. Good afternoon from Paris. Uh, as anticipated, my name is uh, Sara Boudinis, and it's my pleasure today to cover the main highlights from our reports on direct air capture, which can be found on our website. Firstly, what is direct air capture? As the uh, name suggests, direct air capture technologies can capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And this is why they can play an important role in meeting uh, net zero goals. In fact, when you capture CO2 from the air and permanently store it uh, through DAC, what this means is that you are removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And this is why uh, DAC can balance emissions from sectors which are difficult to decarbonize and can also address uh, legacy emissions. So basically historic emissions, which are already in the atmosphere right now. The contribution of DAC, however, goes beyond uh, carbon removal. So air capture CO2 can be a climate neutral feedstock for products that require source of carbon, such as uh, for beverage carbonation, uh, greenhouses, chemicals and fuels, including um, sustainable aviation fuels which are very important for the decarbonization of, decarbonization of this sector. Right now, around the world, there are 18 DAC facilities which are operating uh, in Canada, Europe, and the United States. They are all small-scale facilities. The largest is capturing 4,000 tons of CO2 uh, each year, and the first large-scale 1 million ton um, CO2 
um, plant is in advanced development in the United States and uh, should become um, should come online by the mid 2020s. We have also observed a growing momentum for DAC and especially since the start of 2020. So we have seen governments committing almost uh, 4 billion US dollar in funding specifically for dietary capture and leading that companies have raised around 150 million US dollar in capital. When you um, look at the role of DAC in our IA net zero um, scenario, you see how, um, how much is, is growing from 0.1 million ton a year today to 85 million ton in 2030 and almost uh, one gigaton of uh, CO2 in, uh, in 2050. Um, this uh, um, contribution um, is, it, this, this represents an ambitious expansion that uh, is not only specific of data capture, but represents the scale which is needed in order to reach net zero target. Um, so for instance, to put things into perspective, even the capacity for wind and solar has to quadruple compared to today um, in order to reach net zero target. Around 60% of the CO2, which is captured from the air, is permanently stored, while the remaining 40% is used, um, especially for producing synthetic fuels. As Timur mentioned before, uh, the IA scenario has relatively uh, limited reliance on carbon dioxide removal, so uh, with only two gigaton of CO2 uh, in 2050. And in our scenario, we rely on technology-based uh, removal solutions, which uh, means data capture with storage and bioenergy with CCS. Um, cumulatively, DAC is uh, capturing 12 gigaton of CO2 from the air between 2020, 2020 and 2050. And to put this number into perspective, this is more than the um, energy-related CO2 emissions from all the IA uh, member countries in 2019. In 2050, around 13% of all CO2 emissions which are captured um, are captured through direct air capture and the remaining um, instead um, represent CCUS applications, for instance, for the industrial sector or the uh, power sector. Right now, there are two uh, leading approaches for direct air capture, so solid duct and liquid duct. Solid duct relies on filters uh, which bind with CO2, and then when they are heated, they release the concentrated CO2. And instead, liquid system pass air through chemical solutions uh, by, um, and then recircle the, uh, regenerate and recircle the capture solution back uh, to, let's call it the capture unit. There are also a number of emerging approaches, but they are more at an early stage in terms of technology and market uh, development. The concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is uh, much lower than from a more concentrated source, which could come from a power station or um, an industrial site. And this is what makes um, DAC uh, very energy intensive. So as you can see, uh, both liquid DAC and solid DAC have been designed to um, rely on both heat and electricity, but the share for heat is quite substantial. And um, an important difference is that for liquid DAC, Liquid duct relies on high temperature heat, so around 900 degrees, while solid duct relies on low temperature heat uh, around uh, 80 to 100 degrees. And um, there is a, a key role here for further innovation in order to be able to provide high temperature heat through uh, low carbon energy sources, such as uh, from electricity. In order to capture 1 billion ton of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere in 2050, uh, this would require six exajoules of, of total energy, uh, which is, um, again, to put numbers into perspective, is um, almost equivalent to the total final energy consumption of, um, of France. Um, so because the CO2 is, the concentration of CO2 in the air is quite low, the energy needs are quite high, um, it's more expensive to capture CO2 from the air than from a concentrated point source. Um, cost and energy needs vary depending on a number of parameters, just to mention a few, the type of technology, solid or liquid, the source of energy, fuel, electricity, or both of them, and if the CO2 is going to be compressed for long distance transport or storage or rather be used um, immediately. 
as the technology has yet to be uh, demonstrated, the cost estimates are quite uncertain and ranging from $100 per ton to $1,000 per ton of CO2, which is captured from the atmosphere, according to our own estimate, uh, for a first of a kind large scale 1 million ton duck plant. Um, the cost capture range is um, between around 140 and 310. At the same time, we are talking about a technology which is a demonstration level and therefore has a um, huge potential for um, cost reduction. And cost reduction is especially expected to come from innovative solvent, which can reduce the specific energy consumption of uh, data capture from learning by doing, so basically from deployment, and from the um, economies of scale, which can benefit both uh, liquid uh, duck and solid duck. The industry target appears to be $100 per ton of CO2. And this is also, this is also the target which was chosen um, for the carbon negative shot, which was announced by the Department of Energy back in November 2021, so last year, uh, which is aiming at bringing the cost of uh, data capture down to $100 per ton uh, by 2030. Right now, uh, capture cost below $200, $250 per ton could already be commercially attractive in the United States. And this is because uh, facilities there can access the low carbon fuel standard credits around $200 per ton, as well as the 45Q tax credit, which provides $50 per ton of CO2, which is stored um, underground. So um, as there is a por full portfolio of option for mitigating climate change, there is also a portfolio of option for carbon dioxide removal. Um, so carbon dioxide removal or CDR is an umbrella term that refers to a number of approaches. So we have already mentioned technology-based approaches, so data capture with storage and bioenergy with CCS. There are also nature-based approaches such as afforestation and reforestation and approaches which rely on enhancing uh, natural occurring processes. Um, all these approaches have advantages and disadvantages and they can be compared using different parameters. We have listed um, a few on, on the slide. So the maturity of the approach, the CO2 storage permanence, the capture cost, and the water and land uh, footprint. So when DAC with storage, so DAC is compared with other um, CDRs option, uh, it can offer high CO2 storage permanence when it's combined with geological storage and also low water and, and land footprint. Another advantage of data capture is that there is a high degree of site inflexibility. So in theory, a duck plant could be located virtually anywhere where there is a need for a source um, of CO2 from the atmosphere or where there is a storage site. Um, and um, indeed, in the, in the map here, you can see where um, duck, existing duck plants are located, which is uh, mainly in Europe and um, in the North America. And key consideration for duck sites includes the availability of CO2 storage, um, for which the potential is large, and the availability of uh, renewable energy sources. Um, factors which are quite important from an economic perspective for the location of DAC are the very high renewable uh, energy potential, um, low fuel prices, and also a strong interest for CO2 use or for the um, CO2 circular economy. However, this uh, site inflexibility has um, some limitations, and in particular, it's important to test uh, dark in different locations, especially those characterized by very high, very dry, very humid, or very polluted air. So as we have seen, the net zero uh, scenario requires an immediate and accelerated scale up of DAC, calling for an average of eight large scale, one million ton uh, duck plant to be built each year between now and 2030. And in order to reach this goal, we have identified six priorities. The first one being, of course, demonstrating data capture at scale. And this is very important in order to understand costs, potentials, and um, as well uh, for duck technologies, but also for its supply chain. And it's important to have targeted policies and programs which are, are needed for near term demonstration and deployment. Of course, some, um, another aspect which is needed is to foster innovation across the DAC value chain. And this is particularly important for reducing manufacturing and operational costs. 
uh, to um, make low carbon energy available and able to supply uh, high temperature heat, and also to reduce the cost of CO2 use applications such as those for uh, synthetic aviation fuels. The um, DAC can uh, provide CO2 removal as a service only if CO2 storage is available. So of course it's important to identify and develop CO2 storage. We know the potential is vast, but we also know it takes up to 10 years to develop uh, a site which is suitable and this could act as a break on the deployment of, of DAC. And in order to, for DAC to be recognized in, uh, in national emission reporting and carbon markets, it's important to um, develop international agreed approaches for certification and accounting, and this is on a more international level. While on a regional level, um, we, the fifth priority is to identify the role of DAC and CDR approaches in net zero strategies, and this will help identify technology policy and market needs. And last but not least, uh, international cooperation is very important through, for instance, um, Organization, international organizations such as uh, ourselves, so International Energy Agency, the Clean Energy Ministerial, Mission Innovation, the IAGAG. And uh, we can all play a role in promoting knowledge sharing, reducing duplication of efforts, and supporting common um, accounting methodologies. And with this one, I thank you for your attention and I pass the floor back to Timur. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, we'll uh, now move to our panel debate, um, um, where um, my colleague uh, Sarah Boudinis will be joined by uh, two distinguished guests who I would like to ask to put their cameras on um, now. Um, that's, uh, uh, as I said um, earlier, Dr. Emily Grubert, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Carbon Management at the US Department of Energy and uh, Dr. Julio um, Friedman, um, who is chief scientist and uh, uh, at uh, Carbon Direct and non-resident fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Um, for the audience, just to say, you have the possibility to ask uh, questions in the chat um, to us here at the IEA um, or to our uh, two distinguished uh, guests. Please use the time um, during um, this, uh, this panel discussion to pose questions. We will come back to them uh, towards um, the end of um, this uh, event. If I could ask um, the first question to Dr. Grubert, um, which is on uh, the United States and its efforts. Uh, United States has made significant funding available for direct air capture and carbon removal, including as part of the infrastructure bill uh, can you tell us a bit about what um, the United States is doing and why the government uh, has identified direct air capture as a key technology? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me here today. On the topic of carbon dioxide removal in general, I think what you're starting to see out of the US government is really a focus on it as a function. So as, as Sarah mentioned earlier, you know, without some mechanism for negative emissions, you actually don't have the opportunity to create net zero. And so if the target indeed is net zero, you need some carbon dioxide removal. As such, I think a lot of our kind of internal goals and some of the things that we've announced as really long-term efforts within the US Department of Energy are really focused on carbon dioxide removal broadly. So across all of the pathways. I know um, the carbon negative earth shot was mentioned a little bit earlier where we're really moving toward a target of $100 per net metric ton of CO2 equivalent removals by 2032. That one is actually something where we really explicitly defined that as a carbon dioxide removal performance standard rather than a specifically direct air capture related standard. That said, we know that direct air capture, particularly coupled to long-term geologic storage and then of course storage into products that don't result in re-release, it's a really important pathway that gets us toward our overall carbon dioxide removal goals. I think part of the reason why we've seen such a strong specific early engagement on direct air capture, um, you know, we are working on other types of CDR as well, but direct air capture has kind of been the target, at least within the infrastructure law and then a couple of other contexts, is really because of two things, I think. So one being that we know that this is a really high potential technology if we can actually demonstrate that it can exist in a socially acceptable way, an environmentally acceptable way, and a cost acceptable way. 
but we haven't really tested it yet at the scales that actually would tell us whether we can really drive those costs down. So that potential to really move the needle on something that we don't really see in operations yet is a really important element of this. And I think the other piece of it is, you know, in my office, we focus both on carbon dioxide removal and then carbon dioxide conversion. One of the things about direct air capture that's a little bit different than some forms of carbon dioxide removal is that it does produce a fluid CO2 stream. And so thinking about those carbon-derived products longer term, sustainable aviation fuels, chemical products, and things like that, having access to direct air capture not only gives you a path toward carbon dioxide removal, but also some of these neutral uh, use cases. So I think those two things, in addition to the fact that uh, direct air capture with geologic storage and CO2 conversion specifically leverages a lot of the things that we've really been working on for a very long time in the context of mitigative CCS are probably why we're starting there. But we are really excited about expanding to the whole suite of CDR technologies in the long term. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Grubitz. Um, Julio, um, you are a globally recognized uh, expert in many aspects of CCS and uh, CO2 removal. Um, I think everyone who gets into um, these kind of topics have uh, come across you in one uh, way or another. So now the question really is what in your mind is um, with all your expertise across all these different um, um, pathways, what is different about uh, DEC and where do you see the key opportunities for um, DEC deployment in the near term? Thank you for uh, the question and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, congratulations on the new report. Uh, it's an excellent piece of work. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, one of the things that has changed in the past few years is the recognition that CO2 removal is essential, uh, that there is no way to get to a net zero world without enormous volumes of this. Um, uh, the IEA Global Energy Review uh, for 2021 showed that CO2 emissions are at an all-time high, sadly. Um, to get the 1.5 degree scenario uh, from the IPCC's 2018 report, uh, we need a lot of CO2 removal. Uh, your estimates at the IEA have about two gigatons. IPCC has a range up to seven gigatons. Uh, and we're going to hear more about that, I'm sure, in the, the Working Group 3 report when that comes out on Monday. My personal opinion is that we've moved past moral hazard questions. The climate arithmetic demands enormous amounts of CO2 removal. Uh, that's something, of course, our company does. Uh, that is no means restricted to direct air capture as our only approach. Uh, uh, famously, uh, we did the work for Microsoft to help them find a portfolio. Most of that was nature-based solutions, and that will be the case for a long time. Uh, still, direct air capture has a special place in our imagination, and there's a couple of reasons why uh, that merits the kind of attention your report is giving it. One of them is it's intellectually clean. Uh, there's not a lot of baggage around it. Yeah. Use a big vacuum cleaner to suck CO2 out of the air and then you store it underground. It is straightforward, like a Russian tractor, it does the job. Uh, second, it exists. It's existed for a long time from uh, the, famously the scene in Apollo 13 where they had to create a direct air capture scrubbing unit on the fly to uh, the most recent facility at Orca and the recent announcements uh, at 1.5 plant um, from Airbus and SK uh, that are buying hundreds of thousands of tons of removal. It is valid, it is verifiable and durable. Uh, that's very much the business of Carbon Direct, which is part of the reason we spend so much time thinking about direct air capture. As you say in your report, it is scalable. There are effectively no resource limits on what can be done. And there are many technology pathways to success. You speak about two of them in your report, but there are many or out that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, this begs the question again, what should we be doing now? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, First of all, is that the financing will remain challenging. Uh, unlike a lot of other uh, enterprises, you do not make a product with direct air capture. You provide a service with direct air capture. You can maybe turn that product of CO2 into some other product like fuel. Uh, we think that will be important, especially for aviation, but uh, fundamentally uh, you're providing a service like sanitation uh, or some other thing. And in that context, uh, getting the financing in place requires stronger policy. Uh, we've talked a bit about that already uh, from the low carbon fuel standard in California to the hubs uh, to infrastructure uh, and more the draft provisions that were in the Build Back Better plan. Uh, Build Back Better is not going to legislate, but the draft provisions may move forward. 
uh, the enhancements around 45.2 to $180 a ton would do a great deal to get financing in place and projects up. The EU taxonomy helps, the New York Leadership Act helps, uh, other bills pending, moves like the United Kingdom and the EU commitment to CO2 removal from engineered systems uh, as procurement has helped. I think we'll see new bills on procurement in the US shortly. Um, but there's a couple of things that have changed that are worth clocking. One of them is that there is an enormous amount of room for cost reduction. The National Academies report in 2018 spelled out a bit of that, but good Lord, we are moving fast on that front and there are many, many things to do. Uh, in beyond the technologies which your report talks about, uh, there are new ways to get that cost down. I do believe that we are gonna see costs below $200 a ton this decade uh, as we get to multiple million ton a year plants. Um, we have technologies coming forward like electrical swing absorption, the Verdox system, uh, the heirloom system for mineralization and contacting. Uh, these look like they might have substantially lower costs. We will see, but all of these are off the menu two years ago and suddenly we've got new ways to do it. Uh, I would say that we are starting to see real interest in the global south as direct air capture as an opportunity to grow energy resources and to get paid to do work. Um, some people call that reparations, some people call that restoration, I call that growth and environmental development and economic development. Uh, whatever you call it, that level of interest in places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, uh, Latin America is telling. And I think that this decade we will see projects announced and commissioned in those geographies. Uh, last but not least, uh, there are many approaches now that look a bit like DAX, but are not quite so clean. Uh, some of these are like the bio oil injection approaches that people are seeing. Uh, uh, others uh, that are uh, uh, like enhanced weathering, we're starting to see these other valid durable removal pathways appear. Um, they're gonna give direct air capture a run for their money in terms of cost and scale and performance. But in all of our work, in all of our assessments, direct air capture remains essential. It remains uh, one, the backstop option for the world. Thank you very much, uh, Giulio. Um, you touched on uh, many important points here and I might come back to you on uh, some of them because we are also receiving some related uh, questions in uh, the chat. But before doing so, maybe I can um, go to Sarah and um, ask her about uh, the liquid uh, duct technologies in particular that you mentioned in your presentation. You spoke about um, the high temperature heat um, that they rely on and this is an area for further innovation. Can you, um, elaborate on how these plants are operating today and what are the innovation needs? Thank you, Timo, for the opportunity to expand on this point. Uh, yes, so liquid data capture relies on uh, high temperature heat. And this is because there are a number of units which are used in uh, that liquid data capture plant, which operate between 300 and 900 degrees. So in order to reach that high temperature, um, the design right now is, is including the combustion of natural gas. Uh, however, what I think it's really important to highlight here is that the emission from that combustion are inherently uh, captured together uh, with the CO2, which is captured from the atmosphere. And this is a key point because it means that uh, liquid duct can um, provide CO2 uh, removal because the emissions that are released are much, much smaller than those that are uh, captured from, from the plant. And so right now, this technology is basically relying on combustion of uh, methane. It could also work using, for instance, I don't know, hydrogen or biomethane. But um, in the long term, it's important to have a source, a low carbon source of energy, which is able to uh, reach that, uh, that temperature. And at the moment, the options are not, uh, are not many. Um, we know that uh, electrification for the calciner, which is the unit which operates at very high temperature is possible for small scale application. And we think there is a key role here for innovation in order to be able to do the same on a large scale. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very if much, I Sarah. May, yeah. If I may add very quickly to that, Sarah's last point on electrification is an important one. Uh, those other pathways, which I mentioned just now, the Verdox approach and the heirloom technology are fully electrified. 
uh, and uh, provide pathways then that will not use fossil fuels in the future. That's right. Um, uh, Emily, um, can I ask you a bit about um, your perspective on cost reductions for direct air capture technologies? Um, we have um, in our presentation, Sarah talked a bit about um, our uh, potential views on or our views on what are the key drivers um, for cost reductions. Can you uh, give a perspective here from uh, from your from your side where are you placing your focus right uh, on right now in order to bring down costs for DEC? Yeah, and I think really when we talk about how we're going to bring down costs for DAC, a lot of it is we need to build some facilities and actually learn how to do this, get through the optimization and really yeah, deploy essentially. When we put together the carbon negative shot in the energy earth shot setting, um, one of the charges that we had for coming up with that $100 per ton of net CO2 equivalent removed across technology pathways was really about trying to find a very, very aggressive target. So what level would we see where we would sit back at the end of the decade and say, wow, like we really, really did something that people didn't think we were going to be able to do. So I want to recognize that we know that the carbon negative shot target of $100 is extraordinarily aggressive. Um, also, it's a carbon dioxide removal target, actually. So not just the capture side, it's the whole chain, including MRV. Um, and so one of the things that we really recognize is, yeah, we do actually need to get experience with these technologies. We need to understand what the facilitating infrastructures look like, and then ultimately, we need to check and see where are there actually opportunities where it's more of a design thing, where are there opportunities where there's actually materials, things like this. One thing that does come up, I think, a lot when we talk about direct air capture in particular is what the cost of energy looks like. And that's something that is, of course, very, very dependent on what the rest of the system is. I think one of the perspectives I might offer is that we recognize that direct air capture is not the first priority for use of clean electricity in most cases and what is one of the conclusions of that essentially is that depending on you know how much actual efficiency we're able to deploy how much we see changes in the power sector things like that you could see a situation where the power sector is very very large to support DAC, and you could see one where it's actually substantially smaller because we've succeeded in doing a lot of efficiency interventions and such the cost of direct air capture ultimately does depend quite a lot on mitigation pathways just in terms of how available high quality electricity is that isn't already being dedicated to things like beneficial electrification and so forth so that is a huge uncertainty and it's also part of the reason why we see this target is actually very integrated with a really really aggressive mitigation um, scenario as well. Right. Um, I have, I would like to bring in a question or a couple of questions here, in fact, um, that are, are coming from the chat and if possible, Director Matulio. Um, we see a lot of focus on direct air capture as a carbon removal approach, um, permanently storing the CO2, but of course, uh, you can use the CO2 also for a variety of different purposes as fuels, chemicals, a uh, range of different um, applications. Um, what I'm seeing from the um, chat is that there are, there are questions about aviation, for example, if you could comment on the relative merits of using DEC as a carbon source for uh, e-fuels um, and um, what factors will impact the end use of um, the CO2 that is being captured. Uh, happy to speak about this. Let me say that generally there is a great deal of enthusiasm around uh, using direct air capture as a feedstock for various things, whether it is to make novel cement formulations like carbon cure or carbon built, or whether it is to make synthetic fuels and chemicals. Um, in terms of fraction, I do think the overwhelming fraction will still be just for storage. Um, uh, that makes economic and thermodynamic sense. It also makes climate sense. Um, I do think that the very hardest to abate corners of the system uh, may in fact require some kind of synthetic fuel, uh, synthetic fuels built out of uh, CO2, whether it's aviation fuel or methanol for shipping could very well be viable. I will say they have a lot of competition in the marketplace. Um, there are many pathways to make low carbon sustainable fuels. Uh, one could argue that it is simply cheaper to use fossil fuels for jet and pull the CO2 out of the air. And not uh, the second law of thermodynamics is a harsh mistress. You have to put a lot of energy into these things. But um, from an engineering standpoint, that may be true. From an economic standpoint, we don't know yet. It may very well be that abundant low carbon energy in the future is such that it is simply cheaper to make the synthetic fuels. 
Uh, we will have to see, but um, I expect that we will see synthetic fuels made from direct air captured CO2. I believe they will first be used in aviation, and I believe that will have a substantial but small fraction of that market. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I um, have a lot of sympathy with um, these points in particular. Um, Emily, you spoke a bit about um, deployment and uh, as a key to bringing co costs um, down. Now, as um, my colleague uh, Sarah Boudin has explained in her presentation, we, are, we need a whole lot of direct air capture facilities, at least according to our analysis for net zero by 2050, even in um, the near, near term. And I recognize, of course, how, uh, how massive are the rollout uh, or the, the, the deployment numbers that we are bringing uh, forward here. It's not exclusive to direct air capture, I should say. No? Um, this is a phenomenon that a global net zero by 2050 pathway needs massive rollout across all different clean energy technologies, across all different sectors. But for direct air capture, for some, um, the imagination is, uh, is probably larger because of the state of maturity um, that, uh, that we're talking about. What, how can we fast track uh, the development of these uh, projects? Uh, how can international collaboration, in fact, um, help in order to make that happen in one shape or form? I think one of the things that we run up against a lot in carbon dioxide removal is that there's actually not a requirement that we do this. And I think in many cases where we start to actually see, you know, regulatory or legislative requirements to actually achieve net zero, that's a really strong incentive to actually do it. And, you know, there's a lot of really interesting work going on in voluntary settings or, you know, people really trying to see these technologies scale up. I think ultimately, though, with something like this, that is ultimately essentially a waste management project and a pollution management um, technology without some way to really kind of line that up against an alternative, which in this case would be failing to comply or competing with something else that's more expensive potentially or something along those lines, it's going to be very difficult to get the deployment at the scale we need if it's not actually required that we do it. And so I think that what's really interesting to think about this as opposed to some of the clean energy technologies that we've seen scale really, really quickly is that there's not actually an existing structure that encourages CDR the way there is a structure that encourages the production of power or something like that. And so the more we kind of explore some of the institutional opportunities here, both in terms of you know what is that actual incentive to do CDR and then relatedly, what are the, other things that you could do, who owns them, how big are they, how flexible do they need to be, those types of things. We have huge, huge opportunities to design something that's very, very responsive to this call, but the call needs to be real before we can actually respond. Uh, if I could just add to that a little bit, um, uh, I completely agree with what uh, Emily just said, 100%. Uh, most people don't quite understand uh, uh, how much opportunity and money there is in these systems already. Uh, so for comparison, uh, today we subsidize batteries between $600 and $1,800 a ton of abatement. We subsidize EVs in California at about $7,000 a ton. <laughs> you know, it's like huge amounts of money on these things. Uh, uh, biofuels are subsidized between $300 and $500 a ton. Uh, and those are for things that actually deliver products, not deliver services. We could go a lot farther in terms of the scale of the incentive to get this to market. Conversely, if we wanted to do this in a regulatory pathway, we can do this through compliance options. Right now, direct air capture is not a compliance option in most markets. The voluntary market in 2021 was a billion dollars. The compliance market was $859 billion. Possibly there's more money in one versus the other and there's more opportunities in one versus the other. All good points. Uh, in fact, I would bring, like to bring in a question from the chat um, right now, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, somehow is related uh, yeah, related to the points that we're discussing right now, which is about what would be needed in terms of regulatory frameworks to allow credits issued under carbon removal schemes, in particular DAX credits, to be used under carbon emission trading schemes. Are there any particular views, um, uh, Julian? Yeah, so a couple of things. The EU has already taken a whack at this with the taxonomy. Um, uh, I think that the SEC uh, draft proposal, proposed ruling will help straighten out some of this. This boils down to a, a number of things called, including standards. Uh, and this is something that uh, the IEA in their report and Sarah in writing it uh, pointed out, having a clear understanding of what qualifies as good enough 
helps reduce market uncertainty and gets people to pay. Um, I think there are other things that can be done to accelerate and facilitate the deployment. Some of this is better regulatory reform. Uh, I think many people find the class six process to be burdensome and there are ways to streamline and improve it that make it faster and cheaper. Um, similarly, the infrastructure is the big thing. And I'm so pleased that your report and that Emily have already talked about infrastructure. We need dedicated CO2 storage sites. We need more pipelines around the world. All of this will make it faster and easier to get to market. Thank you very much, uh, Julio. Um, now, I, I would like to ask a more technical question now to Sarah, if, uh, if I may. Um, it's about um, cost. No cost is um, everything that is uh, clean energy technology is costly when it comes into the market initially, but cost can fall uh, rapidly. But in order to do so, we need to understand cost structures. So you talked about in the presentation that the cost of capture is not the same as the cost of removal. Can you uh, explain how they differ and what um, our estimates are for removal? Thank you for the question. Yes, so when we talk about the cost of capture, what we mean is how much it costs to capture one uh, ton of CO2 from the atmosphere. And the main difference with the cost of removal is that when you are estimating the cost of removal, you're also taking into account the life cycle um, emissions of the direct air capture plant, which include uh, the construction, the operation, and also the decommissioning of a DAC plant. And we have seen how energy intensive uh, DAC operation is. So of course the operational uh, aspect is, is quite substantial. And there is where, um, this is why we need low carbon energy sources, because basically the least, um, well, the, the, the more carbon intensive, let's say, your energy source is, the lower uh, is gonna be your removal efficiency and the higher is gonna be your cost for removal. And in terms of, um, assessment, the cost of removal can be even like a double the cost of capture or more depending on uh, which energy source you're using. And this is particularly true, for instance, when you power um, direct air capture with electricity from the grid, which by jurisdiction can change, uh, can vary by, quite substantially. Yeah, thank you. And if I may ask you a follow-up question um, that is uh, coming in from the, the chat, um, and it relates a bit to some of the earlier points on uh, carbon removal versus um, CO2 storage. Um, how much of the CO2 captured will be stored in geological storage and how much of it will be used in synthetic fuel, chemical production and other applications such as to boost uh, productivities and what, uh, well, we've discussed some of the factors that will impact the end use, but what is our current perspective on, um, uh, on storage versus use for these emissions? <laughs> So um, in terms of um, our IA net zero um, emission by 2050 scenario, most of the CO2, which is captured either uh, using bioenergy with CCS or that the capture is stored underground. Uh, from, for DAC specifically, we have a ratio between uh, around 60, 40%, so 60%, which is uh, stored underground and 40%, uh, which is used for uh, synthetic fuels. I think here it's important to highlight that there is a role for both. So there is a role for carbon removal and there is a role for um, CO2 utilization. And hopefully they will both be part of the uh, portfolio of technologies that we help us um, reach the net zero target. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I have another question here from the chat that I would like to um, post to Emily, if I may is about um, uh, the public perception um, of uh, direct air capture. You already on CO2 removal um, in uh, general negative emission technologies. Um, you spoke about the difficulty of rolling out um, these kind of technologies, but we didn't speak so far about what the public thinks about these technologies. Is there any data, any surveys that you're aware of? Do you have any insights on um, um, the public perception that uh, comes with such technologies? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one that we think about a huge amount because it really is an industry that doesn't exist yet that could, could potentially be really significant. There are some surveys and some initial work kind of just talking to people about what they're looking to do. 
I actually think that we need to go well, well beyond this notion of kind of public acceptance and public perception, especially for something that we haven't really done yet, because there's a massive opportunity to really actually integrate the design of these systems and the design of the institutions that manage them from the beginning with people that are going to be hosting these facilities, owning these facilities and interacting with them. And so I think that contrary to a lot of the way that we kind of tend to talk about public perception is, you know, we'll build a plant, see what people think about it. We have this massive, massive opportunity to really design these systems in a way that actually fits with our social context. That part of it and this kind of consultation approach and those types of things, I think is a really, really significant way of how we think about this at DOE. Specifically, as we think about environmental justice issues, we're really trying to expand this to all questions of justice. So again, thinking about ownership, thinking about design, thinking about appropriate deployment in communities in a way that actually fits with those communities' needs, et cetera, which is, again, really a pretty exciting opportunity, also kind of a scary one, because there's a lot of things that, you know, there's a lot of spaces that this could go into. But I think you will continue to see us at DOE at least really trying to integrate a lot of the social science underlinings of these technologies as we move forward. We kind of see our role as trying to do the research and development that suggests whether these systems can exist at commercial scale, which means that they're integrated with society. And so we need to not just know that they work, we need to know that they work for people and with people as well. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing probably more surveys and more interviews and things like that, but really trying to get as far as co-design, I think is the goal right now. Well, thank if you I very could much. add, yeah, if please. I could add very briefly to that, uh, I want to echo one thing that Emily said at the beginning, which is important. Public opinion on this today is largely unformed. Most people don't even know that you can do it, much less what it is or how you would do it or where you would do it or anything else. Uh, this we're not going to build huge direct air capture plants in Brooklyn. We're going to build them in uh, uh, complex parts of the world, some in communities, some far from communities. With respect to how the public thinks about this. The other thing I'll say is that the surveys that I've seen, the language that is used in the surveys matters a great deal in how people respond, which again reflects the fact that we don't really know what the public thinks about this. Last but not least, there is more than one public. Uh, I live in California and there's parts of California that absolutely push back against it and other parts of, in California that love it and are trying to build plants. Um, there, there is no one public in any one place. And I would encourage people to reject the idea that there is a public sentiment of any kind. We simply don't know. It is too early and very, very granular in terms of how people think about these things. That's a very good point. Um, and I would like to ask you a last question, if I may, and thank Julio. It's about um, CCS um, more broadly in a way. Um, and we've talked now about public perception um, of a specific technology and um, there's sometimes obviously a perception out there um, historically certainly um, that um, there is a distraction that comes from uh, from uh, direct air capture and other carbon dioxide removal approach from the task of actually bringing down emissions but there's also another related debate which is what is the place where we should prioritize um, uh, carbon capture utilization and storage type of rollout in the near term uh, DAC is the most expensive form of CO2 capture at the moment, far more expensive than capturing from industrial sources, for example. Shouldn't we focus first on these opportunities? Isn't this our in immediate task or how do you see that? Yeah, uh, first of all, I do not have a lot of time for the moral hazard perspectives around this stuff. Um, uh, we are just past that. Um, we lost two decades on carbon capture for moral hazard. We lost a decade on, mid on adaptation for moral hazard. We just can't, we just can't afford this. Uh, and I, again, I believe that the IPCC and the IEA analyses pretty comprehensively conclude that you need it. So if you need something, if it's required for success, then you have to invest in it and develop it. And the first place that you start, it, we know the recipe for reducing cost. The reducing cost is the kind of innovation platform that the Department of Energy is executing. You put money into R and D and demonstration and scale up and learning by doing, and then you get the cost down. Um, uh, I do not know a single politician or a single investor who wakes up in the morning and says, what is the thermodynamic optimum and economic optimum of my process? Um, yeah, we, it would be cheaper if we did more point source capture and we would get more abatement if we did it. We should absolutely do that. It would also be cheaper if we did a lot more efficiency. We should absolutely do that. Um, 
In some cases, it'll be cheaper if we do a bunch of green hydrogen, but we know that we need this technology. We know it. If we know that we need it, we should prioritize developing its costs and reducing them and getting performance and getting human capital in place and building the infrastructure and all the things we know we need. Because if not, we're just gonna fail. It is like asking, you know, what is the most important part of our body? You know, and it's like, they're, they're all important. You need all of them or else you don't, or it doesn't work very well. <laughs> um, and so the, since we know that we need this, it, it is essential work. Uh, and how you prioritize budgets is really the question that people are asking. How do you balance one investment strategy versus another or one priority versus another? That is very hard work. And it is also the same question as how do you balance these needs with say energy security or medical research or education? Uh, there are many priorities in the world, but if you know something's required, you better get it done. That's a very good way um, for concluding uh, today's uh, session. Um, as our Net Zero by 2050 report showed, um, we definitely need a wide uh, range of different clean energy technologies pushing anything what we have into the market um, this present decade and innovating on all um, what we have not yet, what we don't have in the market yet, but which, will, which we will need at scale towards 2050, uh, also this decade. So this really um, resonates very strongly with Julia's last point. Um, I think that there is no time to spare um, and um, push um, uh, clean energy technologies across um, the broad uh, spectrum of uh, opportunities. I would like to thank our distinguished uh, panel, uh, Dr. Grubert from um, the uh, uh, US uh, uh, Office of Carbon Management at the DOE, Julia Friedman um, uh, and um, our uh, excellent colleagues here, um, uh, Sarah Boudinis, the author of um, this uh, report that you can uh, find online on our uh, website for free download. And I would like to particularly thank uh, Samantha McCulloch, our able head of our uh, CCS unit here at uh, the IEA who's been uh, directing uh, this study and many, many more things here at the IEA on uh, CCS. Thank you again for um, being with us uh, today. Thank you very much to our panel and uh, see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>